All right, so a couple of weeks ago, we introduced a new series on the fruit of the Spirit. These are things that, that characterize the life of a Christ follower that we want to grow in, that we want to produce as believers. Now, fruit is the, the outward expression of an inward nature. And whatever fruit you're producing, and there's a lot of different kinds of fruit you can produce that are not the nine fruit of the Spirit, uh, those are the things that you're designed to in your heart, on the inside, to produce from the outside. We need to work on the inside part of us. We say that when, when you see a, a plum hanging from a tree, you got a pretty good idea, because my daughter's a plants and soils a student. We say, okay, if there's a plum hanging on that tree, there's a pretty good chance that's going to be a plum tree. See, it's that kind of science that you come to church for, right? It's probably a plum tree. And when you see these nine fruit of the Spirit on display in a life, you say, that's somebody who belongs to Jesus. That's someone who is a growing, uh, becoming, developing follower of Jesus Christ. There's one fruit. We'll say one fruit and nine flavors that it comes in. This is the list from Galatians chapter 5. We'll actually spend our time in the message time in Philippians to amplify on the fruit today. But here are, the, here are the fruit of the Spirit as described in Galatians 5, and it says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know, years ago there were some archaeologists they were working in in Rome, and it was at the site of an ancient prison, uh, particularly active in the third century, and that was a time of great persecution among Christians in, in Rome. It was a harsh time, a difficult time to be a believer. And this prison housed people who were on their way to the Colosseum to have to be thrown to the lions. They were going to die. Persecution was off the charts. And, and it was there that a, a fragment was found of a letter in the ruins of that prison. It was written in the third century in that terribly difficult time for Christians. And it's been assigned to different people. We're really not completely sure the person who wrote this note. But in the face of great persecution, in the face of overwhelming difficulty, and uh, seemingly uh, little hope for any day, this is... This is what was written. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who've learned a great secret. They found a joy which is a thousand times better than the pleasure of our sinful life. They're despised and persecuted, but they care not. They have overcome the world. These people are Christians, and I am one of them. A powerful testimony. It's a bad world. Oh, my. We talked about it last Sunday, and we prayed about it. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But God offers to fill you in the midst of a bad world with great, great joy. All of these fruit of the Spirit, we talk about the the gifts of the Holy Spirit, well, the fruit of the Spirit is also a gift from God. It's an act of God's grace. He gives it to us not because we earn it, not because we deserve it. It's a, it's a grace gift. But of, but of all the nine fruit of the Spirit, joy is, is the most closely connected to, to grace. They're, they're like twins. They're not identical twins, but they come from the same, the same family. We find that these two words, grace and joy, are born of the same root. Grace, the Greek word is charis. The Greek word for joy is kara. So, you might say that if you're going to define, <laughs> define joy, joy is grace enjoyed. Joy is grace being experienced and overflowing in how we see our world. We're going to talk about joy today from the most joy-filled book in the Bible, and that is this book of Philippians. I invite you to turn there. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It's one of Paul's letters. It's not a real long book, but it is a joy-filled book. And, uh, and I like it. 
it's unique among Paul's letters because it's written to some people he really loved. Sometimes he's writing to 1st and 2nd Corinthians are written to churches he had worked in, churches he knew a lot of people who were part of those churches. And sometimes they were just hard people to love. And that, that comes through in some of his writing, comes through in some of his interactions with the Corinthians. They were hard to love. The people in Philippi, they were easy to love. And he loved them so very deeply. And uh, if out of all the churches he worked with, I guess you'd have to say that uh, he clearly played favorites with the Philippians. Uh, he loved them, and there's several reasons for it. He helped to found the church at Philippi. Th that church had begun. He'd just gone and found some people who were praying on a riverbank, and he got together with that little group, core group, and now they, they blossomed into a healthy church, a func fully functioning church. God was at work in them and through them, and they weren't perfect. And Paul knows that. They knew that. But they were heading in the right directions. Makes them different than a lot of people who name the name of Christ. They say, oh, I'm not perfect. But I'm not also not trying to lean that way. But Paul said this about them. He said, every time I think of you, I thank God for you. That immediately when you come to mind in Philippi, my heart immediately overflows with thanks because of the wonderful people you are. The issues he raises with the Philippians... Or, man, if it's, if it's at Corinth, it is major surgery all the time with those guys. They needed an overhaul of their motor. But for the Philippians, it's, it's more preventive, preventive maintenance type uh, health care than major surgery. The church at Philippi, they're not wealthy. In fact, one of the poorest groups of believers financially, materially, that Paul's going to deal with. He, sees other, he deals with other churches that just... They got all kinds of money, not these folks. And yet, they overflow with generosity, the most generous church that Paul deals with. And as Paul talks to them, some of the things he says about them are so overwhelming that, that they have supported Paul's ministry when he's with them, but not just, okay, he's with us, now we can cut him off. But no, they support him when he's out in other places, when he, wherever he is in the world, because they have shared Paul's heart and the heart of the Lord for the whole world to know Jesus now, I want to tell you why God brought me to Philippians, why I think this is an appropriate place for us today. And I'll tell you this, I love this church. And God's doing so many wonderful things here. A lot of you have been traveling a lot during the summer, and a lot of, a lot of uh, responsibilities and commitments all over. And you know, We're getting back in now. This, the beginning of a school year pulls everybody back home. And I want to tell you, God has done some incredible things in the last several months in the life of our church. And for, for me, in my you know, 21st year of being here, uh, the, first, the first eight months of this year have been my favorite eight months in ministry ever, ever. We're seeing God do things we never imagined God would do in ways we never imagined him being able to do them. And this is a, this is a special season, and you need to... So some of you, you know, say, what's been going on? Well, you need to lean into this, and you need to listen. And those of you who've been a part in the middle of some of that, you need to tell those stories to other people who can lean into it with you. And I want to invite you to join us in what God is about, because this is a, a special time in the life of our church. God's hand is evident in us, around us, and I'm grateful for this church, uh, Partly because you're willing to follow me on a journey that we started back in January uh, in, these, in the things that we've been about. And I, I tell you this, God's put me in several different situations in the last few months where I've been with groups of pastors. And man, it's, it's a rough world out there for pastors. Uh, the world is changing so fast. The, the turmoil in just in the country has created uh, so many difficulties in the pastoral world. And and then just the internal things that happen in churches. And I listened to these guys tell their stories. I was with a group Thursday. And again, just, boy, just heartbreaking stuff. And I'll be with a group of pastors next week. And then I'm going to spend a week with a group of pastors, the two weeks beyond that. And I already know some of the things going on there. And I hear them tell their stories. And they go, oh, man, they will pray for you. And I send notes of encouragement to my fellow pastors. And and then I come back here and I say, man, I'm so glad I'm here. I love being here. Uh, sometimes under my breath I say, wow, it stinks to be you. But man, 
I love being here. You, you ought to come join our church. These are awesome people, and they love the Lord, and they're leaning into some big things, and I'm so proud of them. Uh, and I say, I thank God every time I remember you, and it is a blessing and privilege to serve in a place like this. And it doesn't mean we've accomplished everything God intends for us to accomplish as a church family, but there's so many good things, and they're, they're obvious apparent things that are taking place in the life of our church. There's another reason I'm drawn to the book of Philippians today. We do live in uncertain and troubled times. And, and so did the church at Philippi. Uh, th their culture wasn't accommodating toward their faith. Christians felt marginalized in this community. It was hard to be a Christian in Philippi. There was nothing easy about it. They were challenged at every turn. And that was just trying to be a Christ follower. But, but then you, you get down to... They're still trying to raise kids. There's family stuff, and there's marriage stuff, and there's work things, and then just the crisis things that arise because people get sick, and things go bad. And, and in the midst of all that, I'd say this. A lot of you come to uh, this Sunday, and you're experiencing pretty good difficulties too, and, and some, some significant hurts and hardships. And when Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, he wasn't writing uh, some kind of Pollyanna. Everything's always great when you're a Christian prosperity gospel letter. But he was writing to real people living in a real world and a hard world. And in, in that context, he also writes to us. And, and the question for us, I think, as we look at a book like Philippians is, how are we doing it, living out this Christian life in this world? And this, is, this is the world in which we live. This is the time that we have been created by God to live out as Christ followers, uh, different than other periods of time. This is where he put us on the planet for now. And how are we doing with living out this Christian life in this context? And living out what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And what, what is a Christian supposed to look like in this context? And there are a lot of definitions flying all over about what a Christian is and what a Christian isn't, and what a Christian does and what a Christian doesn't do in these times. And as I've studied this book of Philippians, I've come to believe the Bible teaches. And it's obvious, it's clear, it's evident, apparent, that the, the, an overwhelming characteristic of a person who says, I belong to Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven one of these days. That the overwhelming characteristic of such a person, such a life, is designed by God, the thing that's going to set you apart from a culture that's so far from God, from false teachers who say, I'm a Christian, but here's how I do it. And it's, ooh, that's dark. What sets us apart is our joy. The concern is this. Is that how the world sees us? You know, as a Christian, the people, when they see, and I'm not talking about, why, yes, I'm the most joy-filled person I know. Well, you may need to get to know more people. Are you, do, do the people who know you best, the people who spend time with you, do they look at you and say, there's something about them that's just different. No matter what's happening in their life, in them, around them, they just go at life differently. They're... Does, does joy characterize us in a hard world? Paul says the world should see joy in us. And Paul lives it out. He models it. He teaches it just like Jesus modeled it and taught it. If we're going to look for a theme for this book, uh, we're going to find ourselves drawn to the theme of joy. The, the, the words that form uh, and get translated out as joy or rejoice occur about 16 times in the book of Philippians. This is just four short chapters. This is a short book. So if you're reading a book in the Bible and a word occurs that many times, you're going to have to say, okay, I need to tune in at a different level because this is a big deal in this book. And joy, rejoicing is the overwhelming theme of this book. A uh, few illustrations to get us, get us to where we'll read our text. Some of you have traveled, have traveled in Europe and... Uh, when you travel in Europe, you get to see lots of castles. Uh, I was reading a story, a guy who had done some travel in Germany just recently, and talking about beautiful castles. And I, I read this, that 
if, if the family, the story behind this, on the tourist, tr tourist trek this guy had made, he said the story was on the German castles that the family who owned the castle was in residence in the castle at that time, then their family flag would fly from the highest tower of the castle. That's how you knew the, the family was at home. Uh, no, no flag, no family was the, was the idea. And this person then made a spiritual application I really appreciated. A couple of quotations about joy as it relates to the flag illustration. The first goes like this. The most infallible proof of the presence of God in a person is joy. It's the flag we fly from our towers when God is at resident in our hearts. The second is, joy is the flag we fly from our countenance when Christ is in residence in our hearts. No flag, no divine presence. See, the fruit of the Spirit, not only, it, it's an identifier, it's a clarifier. Do you belong to Jesus, and are you living the right relationship to Christ? And joy is important. Here's some quotes from different folks talking about joy. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. was a member of the United States Supreme Court for 30 years. At one point in his life, he wrote this. He was explaining why he chose, chose being a judge, going into the legal system as his career. He said, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. Yeah, like, okay, well, I can't wait to finish this jar of pickles so I can just drink the pickle juice. Well, that's, that's what I'll do to you. Billy Sunday was a well-known evangelist. He said, the trouble with many men is that they've got just enough religion to make them miserable. If there's not joy in religion, you've got a leak in your religion. I like that. Oswald Chambers, maybe you're familiar with his devotions, once said, we carry our religion as if it were a headache. There's neither joy nor power nor inspiration in it. None of the grandeur of the unsearchable riches of Christ about it. N none of the passion of hilarious confidence in God. And one man who chose to remain unnamed said, The solemn saints discourage many folk from being good, while the gaiety of sinners makes more converts than it should. What, is, what does joy look like in your life? And I have a picture here. Oh, I'm joy-filled. Well... You, you can say, I've got great joy. Oh, yes, joy. But everybody else is seeing these faces. And, and it's, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, can't we do better? Can't we do better? Joy is an important word in the Bible. 158 times uh, joy, rejoice, occurs. Uh, 158 times for joy. Uh, actually, 198 times for rejoice. In the Old Testament, there are 27 different phrases that come out to translate joy and rejoicing. Words like run around with delight to shine like the brightness of the sun. It's an overflowing. There's an outward expression of the inward relationship to God that spills over into all of life, joy rejoicing. I, I read uh, a missionary that when they were trying to translate the Bible, translation's a tough thing cross-culturally, and they were trying to translate the Bible. Eskimos in, in far northern Alaska they were trying to translate the Bible for a people group that didn't have any Bible in their own language, and they ran into a problem. And this happens in translation on a regular basis. They have no word for joy in their, in their, in their language. So what are you going to do if there's no word for joy? Well, you, if there's not a word, you have to find a word picture, something that they identify with. So here's what these missionaries translating the Bible did. They went looking. What's the most delightful, joy-filled experience that these folks have on any given day? What's the thing that's common to the whole village that, that brings what we would consider joy in uh, our English translation? So, they went looking. Well, they figured out what it was. The most joyful moment in the village was in the evenings when the people fed their sled dogs. Because when they fed these dogs, the dogs were just so excited about it. And they, they, they had a whole lot of joy. They were yipping and, ha and happy and wagging their tails and so excited and jumping around. And the people who were coming out to feed them and care for them, well, they just thought it was hilarious too. And they, they would laugh and it, it spilled over and it was just the most fun thing the village did all the time. So that's what they used to translate joy. And I suppose if you would translate the passage from Luke where it says, after the resurrection, the disciples saw Jesus and were full of joy. I suppose the way they translated that then would, when the disciples saw Jesus, they just wagged their tails with delight. I, I, 
Can't guarantee that, but you know, you get the image, right? It's joy, and it ought, to, it ought to spill over. We may be tempted to say, well, sure, Paul, Mr. Mr. Joy, but he's a who's who guy in the Bible. He's Mr. Superstar. People listen to him. He wrote all these books in the Bible. He's famous. He's popular. He's, he's, got, he's all that. Well, oh, sure, easy for him to be joy-filled because of all he had. And I'll tell you, there's not a person here who'd want to trade places with Paul. Not at the time he wrote this. Uh, scholars mostly believe that Paul was writing from Rome where he was under house arrest, a prisoner. He's riding from jail, chained to a Roman soldier, not sure what the future held for him. You know what had happened? He'd, he'd been arrested and hauled off to Caesarea by the sea. This is a Caesarea Philippi, a Caesarea by the sea. He's there. It's where the Romans centered their government in the, that area, the region of Israel. And he's there under trumped-up false charges, and everything is questionable. And, and then they're trying to manipulate the legal system, and he sees, they're going to kill me. This is going to take me out without me having a voice. And he happens to be a Roman citizen because of where he was born. And because of his Roman citizenship, he has a right to appeal all the way to Caesar. And he plays the card, I appeal to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go, says the governor. And so this is how he ends up in Rome, in prison. And, you know, timing's everything. And the, the emperor is Nero, who's insane. And it'll ultimately be Nero who will take Paul's life. So here he is. Now, he's a, he's a prisoner of Rome in not the best of circumstance, but he's also, he's still interacting with churches, and a lot of these people, they're, they're criticizing him, attacking his character, questioning his motives, and these are other believers. He's catching it from the pagans. He's catching it from his fellow, fellow Christians. It seems that, everything's rough for Paul, and yet in these circumstances, Paul rejoices. This is not the first time. When Paul and Silas went to Philippi originally, they ended up, they often got in trouble. Paul, Paul wasn't the guy that, we've, we've been having folks go out into the community and just offer to pray for people and to share the good news of Jesus. And We go out in pairs, sometimes three of us. Uh, you, you go out with partners. Really, you wouldn't, I want to go out with Paul. That sounds like a good idea. He was just always going to get you into a mess. So Paul and Silas, they go out, and they end up in jail in Philippi. And got beaten up pretty good, and they're in stocks, and they're in the depths of this prison, and prison's pretty rough in the first century. And, and what are they doing? Oh, they're just celebrating Jesus and singing songs and having a good worship service there in the prison because that's how, that's how Paul did it. All the time. Joy was a companion of Paul in every circumstance. Now, most of us can be joyful when everything's working out the way we wanted it to anyway. Like, what makes you happy? When are, when's everything good? When it's all going just the way I want it to. What happens when it's not going that way? What happens when just the natural events that happen in life that sometimes there's loss and sometimes there's hurt and sometimes there's sickness and that's a part of us living in a, in a fallen world. What happens when it's not going our way? Uh, can we be immensely joyful in those circumstances? But Paul, he talks about joy and rejoicing. Joy and rejoicing that reaches beyond just as long as everything around me is good. I'm good. Joy that go, goes beyond as long as life is easy, as long as my will is being done in the world, I'm all good. He talks about joy that's deeper than most people ever know. And how can we live a life of joy? This kind of joy that it, it can't be broken, it, it can't be touched, it can't be weakened. And just a brief outline that'll take much less than an hour to complete. For the record, I want to read the first two verses of Philippians. Because this gives us just some starter material. Well, where, what's the source of our joy? Why should we be such a people? What, how is it possible in such a broken world to live this life of joy and the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy? Verse 1. And this is a letter, and this is how it begins. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you 
and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have joy in eternal life. And don't miss this part. That's the first. We have joy in eternal life. And we're going to wrap that around that little phrase, in Christ. Servants of Christ. We are in Christ. And that's Paul's favorite way to talk about what it means to be a Christ follower. We often define uh, our happiness, our satisfaction with life, whether or not we are capable of joy by the absence of something. We say, well, as long as my life is absent of pain, of suffering, of disappointment, I can be quite joyful. But if undesirable things, if undesirable things come into our life, then suddenly our happiness, our joy, our ability to have a sense of satisfaction and contentment with our, with our life, even in Christ, gets stolen away. For Christians, joy is the response to an inward, eternal relationship to God. It's what happens when he's in here. It flows out there. Circumstances can't touch that relationship. And God brings meaning to the most difficult, hardest of circumstances. That little phrase, in Christ, occurs over a hundred times in Paul's writings, multiple times in this little book called Philippians. And that, that in Christ is a simple picture of what it means to have a relationship to Christ. It points to the po closest possible reunion. It's not just he's nearby. It's not just, he's, he's the, my least favorite way anyone ever talks about God. The man upstairs looking down on me. It's a whole lot better than that. It's a whole lot more real than that. It's like, look, we are wrapped up in Christ. Not, not at a distance, not far away. He is, he is all around us, in us, on us. The closest possible union with him in Christ. Paul wrote, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. There's your identity. You're a new creation. The old passed away. The new has come. Colossians 1.27 gives a further explanation. Uh, Christ in you. Christ, we're in Christ. Christ in us. That's the hope of glory. Eternity with him. Now, our joy comes from being in Christ. And if there's been a time in your life when you, you believed in him, you said, what Jesus did at the cross, I believe it paid for all my sin. I believe he was raised from the dead. I believe he's God and he's perfect. And I want to surrender my life to him. He's going to be in charge. He's the master. He's the Lord. He's the king over my life. He's going to reign. And I want to dedicate myself to grow, to become more like Jesus, and to be on mission for him in this world. I've committed my life to this. When you have a relationship to Christ, you are in Christ. And that relationship is all settled. Here's the great part. A relationship to Christ is not just, oh, my sin's forgiven. He's around to help me right now. But eternity's settled too. You know heaven's going to be your home one of these days. And nothing can steal that from you. Nothing can take that from you. Now, we, we talk about martyrs. You look at Paul and how he writes about his, his probably going to die uh, here in, in Philippians. And it's hard to beat a guy like Paul because he doesn't have to survive to win. He says, well, if I stay here, great. If my life is over, even better. You can't beat a guy like that. Your joy overflows and overwhelms any other obstacle. You're free to live a life that counts. And you find joy in life. Second thing, joy in eternal purpose. He says, servants of Jesus Christ is how he describes himself and Timothy. Servants of Jesus Christ. This is a purpose. I've told you before, I have long loved playing Monopoly. It's a process of accumulating properties and hotels and money and, and vanquishing other people, of crushing them and taking away uh, their joy. That's the purpose of Monopoly. And if you survive to the very end of the game and you've crushed this opponent and you've broken this opponent and finally at the end of the game, They've all walked away in shame and disgrace. And you find yourself, it all belongs to you. So that's, that's the end if you win in Monopoly. And then, and then it all goes back in the box. It all goes, you, you want to super glue it down and remember it forever and cherish that moment. But it all goes back in the box. And, uh, of course, 
we sometimes say that uh, for us, you're going to accumulate a lot of stuff. A lot of people are really on a mission. Depends on what kind of house and what kind of car and what kind of career, what it says on the, the door plate on my office, what my kids have accomplished, what I've accomplished, this resume of things. But, you know, most all that, it goes back in the box, too, at the end of the game. In fact, you go back in the box at the end of the game. That's, that's, that's the way the road goes in this life. And if all that goes back into the box, all that stuff, the awards, the accomplishments, the titles, the, the stuff, then at the end, what, what's going to remain? What's going to be around when all that's back in the box? Paul challenges us by his example to spend our lives on purposes that are going to last. To, to pour ourselves into things that will touch eternity. To always have that touch that reaches way beyond us. To make a real difference in the things that make a difference in our lives for eternity. In our family for eternity. In our, our, in our workplace. Uh, wherever we are all the time for eternity. He says of himself and his young friend Timothy. Servants of Jesus Christ. And a servant is just someone that is working on somebody else's agenda. And he, he is a servant of Jesus Christ and is no better master than Jesus. And he surrenders his life completely. I will follow Jesus with all my heart. What he says I will do. His will is going to be my will. And I'm about his agenda and his purpose. And when you find yourself in that sweet spot, and I found myself outside of God's plan, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, and I found myself in God's plan, right in the, in, in the middle of his will. And I found much more joy there, just so you know. And you will too. And so did Paul. Joy when we're servants of Christ. The third thing, joy in eternal relationships. In writing this letter, Paul follows the usual pattern of first century letter writing. He identifies, hey, I'm sending you a letter, and I'm Paul. Which is pretty good, because we have to wait till the end of the letter to figure out who wrote it to us. But him, he lays it out right up front. Hey, it's me, it's Paul, and I'm writing you a letter. He identifies himself. Then he identifies Timothy. The folks in Philippi knew Timothy. They had ministered with him. They had seen him, heard from him. Uh, they knew him from previous visits. And Paul then addresses the letter. It's from Paul. Remember my buddy Timothy. And now address the letter to the saints, the overseers, and the deacons in Philippi. This greeting is sent to other people who share with Paul and Timothy this abundant living relationship to a living God. They have a relationship to him. And they also, these folks, they're in Christ, and they are also servants of Christ. They're, they ha they're on the same agenda. We're wanting to make Jesus known and to know him better. His agenda is our agenda. So these are the recipients of this letter. And he writes to them and he calls first saints. Now, when we think about saints, we say, well, I know a handful of saints in my whole life. You know, this part, oh, what a saint. Oh, what a saint. The rest, oh, you know, kind of garden variety Christians. But to be a saint in the Bible is to be set apart. It means holy ones. And when you're in Christ... You're living as a servant, which is another fruit of being in Christ, a demonstration, a, 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 a declaration that we're in Christ. When, when, when you're one of those, then you are a saint. It's not an elite grouping. It's just people who have a relationship to God. Their lives are set apart, dedicated to God's purpose. Overseers are the spiritual leaders of the church. Uh, sometimes it's translated pastor or elder, but these are those who give spiritual oversight, direction, encouragement to other believers. Deacons, the first century we learned in uh, Acts 6, the deacons were servants. They serve the church, they serve people, and that's how they serve the Lord. And sometimes there are physical needs that they meet, and sometimes we see it as we, we follow Philip and Stephen on through the book of Acts. We see the agenda is a whole lot bigger than just physical needs because they're preaching the gospel. They're sharing the good news of Jesus way beyond themselves. They use their gifts to declare eternal things. One of the great joys in life and ministry for me is always partnering with other people in ministry, mission, purpose, to, to go and do what we do as a church together. Uh, I got an invitation from uh, folks I really, and I was really, want, I really wanted to go. 
uh, to Cuba to do evangelism and pastor training. And they're going to go in, and, uh, but it had to be a small group. Can attract a lot of attention. Uh, go in, uh, uh, 10 people max. And they said, we got a spot for you, and we really love for you to go. They go, man, that's one of those on my list of places I would love to uh, see God at work. Uh, that's one of those places. And uh, then I started thinking, no, I can't do that. Because one of my commitments to, to God uh, and to this church that I really feel a part of my calling is whenever I go, I got to be able to take some of you, some of you suckers with me. Uh, that, that, that I want to bring people in my wake that, that are going to be part of this because what we share together is my favorite part. I would have enjoyed it with those guys, uh, that, that, that team in Cuba, but it's not the same as going with people that are part of my church family. And so when I go out, I always want to take people with me. And uh, we're, we'll, in a couple of weeks, we'll be rolling out an opportunity for some of you suckers. Uh, we've gone the summer a lot of times in our Africa adventures. Uh, we're going to be going sharing the gospel, working with a group of churches in, uh, in Kenya the last week of February into the first few days of March this next year. It's a little different time frame, uh, springtime instead of summertime. But uh, I want to take people from here with me when I go. And to some of you, you can do this. If I can do this, as awkward as I am in all social settings and cross-culturally, you can do it too. All right. It's sharing the experience. And it's doing it together. It's just being on mission, partnering with other believers. When, I, when I'm with other believers, I'm challenged by other believers. I'm encouraged by other believers. I'm held accountable by other believers, I'm blessed by other believers. And as we do this together, one of my greatest joys in the journey of the Christian life, in this journey, my traveling partners, doing this with you, and the things that we, we have shared together over, over years together of seeing God at work and seeing prayers answered and seeing relationships healed and seeing next steps taken and seeing... Seeing God's power on display. Fourth, joy and eternal blessings. Grace and peace. In verse 2, he extends the greeting he commonly uses. He he employs the Greek expression, uh, grace, charis, the Hebrew greeting, peace, shalom. Grace is the undeserved favor of God toward us in which we are set free from the power of sin as a free gift of God where we can have a relationship to God and eternal life in heaven. What an incredible, incredible gift that God offers up to us by grace. And grace is the power of God for living life. It's an empowering, encouraging, supernatural grace for living out this life that he's called us to. And then peace. Peace just seeks right relationship with God. God through Jesus Christ. That relationship comes. And until we know grace, we can't know peace. Uh, Next week, Roger Taff is going to preach on the next fruit of the Spirit, which is peace. Peace is more than the absence of conflict. It's contentment and security and wholeness because because we are where? We're in Christ. We're his servants. Because the people we get to do this with. Grace and peace have multiple applications. Uh, And a lot of opinions about this. I think that all three of these are true. When he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, I think grace and peace are a declaration. He's just declaring that as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, this is your birthright, grace and peace. It's a gift from God. It's a wish at all the ways you could live this Christian life. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to embrace this part? Wouldn't you want to do it with grace? Wouldn't you want to do it with peace? Wouldn't you want that to be the characteristic of this relationship to Jesus? I want it for you so desperately. And I think it's also a prayer. That he expresses his heart to the Lord. Lord, may may your grace and peace be real and active and powerful and transforming in the lives of these precious people in Philippi. These precious people in uh, Allen, Texas, precious people in North Texas, Collin County. 
If you want your life to be characterized by joy, you live it in the light of the grace and the peace of God. And why would you not? A lot of people are known for being sour, being negative, being down. Wouldn't you want to be known for your joy? And how, how's your joy today on your joy meter? Oh, man, there are a lot of things that suck the joy out of you, I know. Uh, sometimes we do it to each other, right? How's your joy today? Where, where's it measuring out? How apparent is it to the people around you? How much do people see it, feel it when they spend time with you, even for a few moments? And you have a good opportunity because you're about to go into small group gatherings where people are going to be evaluating you seriously on your joy. No pressure. But you better be bringing the A game because they're watching you now. Here's the great thing. If Jesus... See, Oh, joy in my circumstances. My circumstances come and go. What if my joy is in Jesus Christ? If my joy is in Jesus Christ, there's nothing that can touch my joy. You know why? No, my joy is going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And forever. Praise the Lord.